Good morning. It's Thursday, October the 15th, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much. The prayer of the day comes from dailyscripture.net. Lord Jesus, may your word take root in my heart and transform all my thoughts and actions. Give me wisdom and understanding that I may know your will for my life and have the courage to live according to it. Amen. Remember that we have free will and that we are moral agents. Only one agenda item for today, and that item is part one of an article from American Conservative magazine titled Counterfeiting Conservatism. And uh, Counterfeiting Conservatism, like I said, is from American uh, Conservative magazine, and it was written by Patrick Deneen. Conservatism is the ism that came into being to resist the existence of isms. This makes for potentially insurmountable challenges. How to invince a political belief that avoids the rigidity of ideology? Can one take a political position without becoming a political program? Can the principle stand against a politics based upon the application of universalized principle avoid becoming universalized? From the first moment that conservatism was articulated as a philosophy, Edmund Burke's critique of the mechanic philosophy of the French Enlightenment that sought the creation of a new society along stiff geometric lines, a philosophy of tradition was born. Distinct from the unconscious practices that make up any given tradition, even as Burke cautioned against a revolutionary spirit that sought to unclothe the mysterious origins and meanings of practices, conservatism was itself forced to call attention to the very existences of the thing it wanted kept shrouded from inspection. Conservatism, qua ism, was thus defined by its opposition to a radical adversary. The dangers of various ideologies to traditional practice forced conservatism to articulate itself in ways that were distinctively unconservative. Even as Burke, and after him thinkers like Michael Oakeshott and Bertrand de Jovenel, denounced theoretical approaches to politics, the defense of tradition itself required theoretical articulation. Ironically, every time conservatism scored a point intellectually or politically, it lost ground since its very articulation depended on terms set by its opponent. Given that conservatism originated in ways that cut against the conservative temperament, over time it's hardly surprising that conservatism has begun to resemble non- and even anti-conservative positions, not only in tactics, but in content. Because conservative, conservatism defines itself relative to the current position of its more liberal opponent. It has come to occupy space that has been abandoned by a leftward-moving opposition. This is particularly true in contemporary American politics, where conservatism has not only crystallized into an orthodoxy, as Sam Tannenhaus argues in this recent book, The Death of Conservatism, but into a political movement that employs scorched-earth political tactics in defense of ends and policies that stand to conserve little. This is hardly a new development in response to the election of President Obama. In the 1980s, it was barely noted as peculiar that one of Ronald Reagan's intellectual heroes was Thomas Paine, Edmund Burke's bete noir, or that a subsequent generation of conservative have defined themselves almost exclusively by the devotion to the revolutionary principles of the Declaration of Independence. Increasingly, political conservatism has stood less for a defense of the principles articulated by Russell Kirk, custom, variety, prudence, imperfectibility, community, and restraint of power, 
and has instead aligned itself with rational or national or even international objectives destructive to custom, variety, and community. Conservatives increasingly demand support for the expansion of military and economic power, resource exploitation with little discussion of impact upon future generations, a globalized market, a standardization of law that is increasingly based in Kantian, rather than common law, reasoning. Democratization abroad, federal rather than local allegiances, mobility, and a loss and, and a... Uh, a loose affiliation, excuse me, with corporations and the financial industry. Hardly hotbeds of conservative practice. The movement's tactics, demanding obeisance by those who would adopt its label and destruction of those who would oppose it, strikes one as more Alinsky than Kirk or Oakshot. And that was a part one of counterfeiting conservatism. Back in a minute. Thank you very much. Who is the socialist? He is the man that seeks consensus rather than develop his own opinions. He is subjective, petty, and small, taking everything in life personally. He's outrageous, boring, and rude. He pretends to be a leader and a change agent. He pretends to be your friend. He is sly, cunning, and deceptive. He dresses, acts, and speaks like a slob. He's informal and terminally unique. He is childish and pretends that he knows nothing. He is pragmatic, has no conscience, and pretends that might makes right and that the ends justify the means. He acts randomly and rationalizes his behavior. Deterministic, blaming others for his mistakes. Skeptical, demanding that others solve his problems. His unreasonableness and irresponsibility make him a bad role model and a bad father, brother, family member, friend, and a bad person, period. So if you think that you should be friends with a socialist, think again. Next episode is part two of Counterfeiting Conservatism. And that concludes another episode of The Drill. Be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and always ask yourself, what is real, how do I know, and what should I do about it? I'm Ron, and that's The Drill. The Drill.